I'm Fiona Miller from the University of Toronto and I lead Cascades, uh, a national initiative of climate action and awareness in healthcare. And I'm joining you from the northern shores of Lake Ontario and specifically from the University of Toronto. Uh, and these lands uh, for thousands of years have been the home of the Huron-Wendat, uh, the Seneca more recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And indeed the word Toronto, I understand comes from the Mohawk word Takaronto, and that's a one interpretation that I have read is of the place where the trees are standing in the water, which I understand to mean a place of the fish weirs, a very productive uh, place of fish, and also a meeting place. So um, for the estimated about 15,000 years of many different First Nations, including Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Patoon peoples, uh, and with colonization, uh, Treaty 13 and Williams Treaties, but importantly, these lands are subject to a treaty that predates uh, the colonial times. The treaty is the dish with one spoon, wampum belt covenant. Uh, and this type of diplomatic arrangement existed here and in many parts of the Great Lakes and Eastern Seaboard. And it was a way for different First Nations to diplomatically negotiate with each other how to live uh, in all their differences nonetheless as effectively one spoon within a single dish. And I think that's exactly the kinds of things that we as folks trying to do sustainability work are trying to learn and understand and embed into our practices, how to live in that way. Uh, and of course, Toronto is um, now today the home to many, many different First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples from across Turtle Island. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to our discussion today and to the amazing speakers that we have. This is the second in our seminar series, which we hope to continue to do uh, on leadership and strategy for sustainable health systems. So we often are talking about very specific activities that we need to take, and both of our guest speakers today have done that work. But we're also trying to talk from that leadership and strategy perspective about how, what are the opportunities to move from the frontline change initiatives that you might be uh, trying to, to move forward to things at a, a sort of meso level that can uh, mobilize sustainability within, say, provincial um, quality improvement programs or national um, uh, professional associations or international uh, collaboration. So how do we move things into uh, I mean, up a notch uh, diminishes the importance of the frontline work, but mobilizes the networks and our colleagues uh, in order to have more systemic change and to embed change in ways that can spread and scale and be sustained. And to help us to entertain these critical issues today, we have these two brilliant speakers, Dr. Carolyn Stigant, who I'm not gonna read their full bios. I'm just gonna give you a quick overview. Carolyn is the medical lead of planetary health at BC Renal. Uh, she's the co-chair of the Climate Change and Planetary Health Steering Committee at Island Health, one of the health authorities in BC, and a co-investigator with the UBC Planetary Healthcare Lab, where she's uh, working on studies of the environmental impact of kidney therapies. She's also the inaugural chair of the Sustainable Nephrology Action Planning, or SNAP, Committee of the Canadian Society of Nephrology. And we at Cascades have been privileged to collaborate with and learn from Carolyn, particularly around sustainable nephrology and really thinking about that also as a model of um, the management of chronic disease from a sustainable perspective. And our second speaker is Dr. David Smith, who is the NISQIP, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, surgeon champion at Northrop General Hospital, uh, where he's a real quality improvement leader and a real leader in, ex in working with frontline teams and exploring how frontline teams can join together and lead efforts to improve surgical quality. And in doing so, also can use those clinical trial platforms to synthesize new surgical knowledge and advance the planetary health agenda. And we at Cascades have been really privileged to work with Dave uh, in the sustainable perioperative care space, including through his uh, leadership in connecting with the Ontario Surgical Quality Improvement Network and helping to create uh, and mobilize and sustain the Cut the Carbon campaign across perioperative teams and then connecting with other such teams across the country. So that's, that's what we have in store today. Uh, and I think we have uh, both of our speakers here. So Carolyn, would you like to get us started? Are you set up? 
Yeah, I'd love to get started. So thanks for the invitation and um, just delighted to be uh, running this meeting with uh, with Dr. Smith and um, thanks to Fiona for her help and inspiration along the way and the entire team at Cascades. So next slide. These are my disclosures. And if you just tap down, um, I choose to disclose carbon expenditures. And I wanna point out that uh, not traveling for this type of meeting saves quite a bit of carbon and uh, we need to normalize uh, these types of hybrid structures. And just page down. Yep, next slide. Right, so these are today's objectives and objective number two, I think is the most important one. So we'll just have fun over the next few minutes here. And next one. So in 2020, uh, my world changed. Um, I've always been kind of uh, in tune with uh, environmental issues. Um, if you just tap down on the slide, it, it was the first big leap for me in 2020 to realize that this kind of thinking and activism could uh, jump into my professional life as well. And that happened one day when I was going out to this um, segment of Gary Oak Patch in my backyard, uh, and I was clearing the invasives. You can see all of those uh, green looking plants on the left are invasives in the Gary Oak Grotto. Um, and I said, oh, I heard the, the CO2 emissions on CBC one morning. And I said, I wonder what normal is. And I saw this graph here and it just shook me to my core and it has mobilized my action since. So page down, um, that sort of led to a stepwise progression to where we are today. And the very first thing I did after reading that green nephrology paper um, was drafting a letter to BC Renal, the administrator of our program, and saying, oh, did you know this? We have to change. And here's what the UK did. And they wrote back to me and they, they kindly essentially said, work on it. Um, and through meeting a lot of people and doing a lot of reading, I realized that I needed to sell this. I needed to know a lot more than I knew. And so I think being an educator was really the first thing. I went away and I got myself an education. You know, I'm established mid-career. I can't go back to school. It, it, so how do you get an expertise and how do you start talking about this issue was I decided to teach a course on it. So I taught myself. Um, and uh, and had a lot of people's help along the way, and then um, got into some research projects uh, with with a you know sort of a passion area myself, and then found a whole lot of people, and then spoke to the right people at the right time, who enabled me to be in a position where we could reach more people and communicate with more people, and that's really the successive actions that you see. And just tap next slide, please. Up in the right hand corner sort of uh, I think is a microcosm of uh, the interactions that happen, you know what happens at the local level really reflects and informs what happens at the regional level, and in turn at the system level and so I find I reflect that all of these actions have happened across a whole sphere of activity. Um, and how that has really enriched the knowledge and experience that I bring to any of the different portfolios and next slide. So this is an abstract uh, that I won't go through the data, but basically we we had a very well-timed, large, impactful paper. And this was through collaborating with the Planetary Healthcare Lab. So this is data that has informed dialysis decision-making. Uh, next slide. And next slide. Um, Again, we don't have to know kidney specific messaging, but I think you know the points in green are the salient takeaway points. And so system thinking became really important and honing the message and figuring out who to direct this message to. And next slide. So we realized very quickly that regionally we weren't going anywhere. And so I'm really thankful to people who controlled the power structures at the Canadian Society of Nephrology for giving us this committee. Um, and the first thing we did was sort of a branding exercise. We did a vision and a mission statement. And this mission to educate, innovate, and advocate for sustainable kidney care continues to inspire and direct me as I go. And if I'm wondering if an action is, you know, within the, a reasonable realm, I kind of go back to that uh, for grounding. And next slide. I won't go through all the things we've done, but you can see there for yourself, there's been a lot of people amplifying this message along the way, uh, the, the editorial board of our Canadian journal, the uh, the society itself, 
um, a lot of good ideas that came out of that. Um, and a, a really key thing that we did in speaking to an international audience was adapt um, Dr. McNeil's framework for planetary health, and we adapted that to kidney care. Um, and that was a, a quite well-publicized publication and as, as well foundational thinking for a whole group of people on this committee, because I realized very quickly that everybody on the committee needed an expertise as well. And next slide. And working with a group, you know, I put these principles in here because the very first thing we did was we got our group to sign on to the Sao Paulo Declaration on Planetary Health. So I'm very proud that we were the first kidney care organization worldwide to do so. And that really was important to me that we sign on. So everyone understands the commitment that we're taking on, the important reasons why we're doing this. And I find that having respect for people's time and understanding how this can be important to them and why it should be important to them so that they can independently pull and we can all work together is a really, really key aspect of this work. It's not just one person driving their agenda. It's making a joint agenda based upon specific priorities, being aware of the system. And next slide. So again, I'm not going to go through all of this, but we have this editorship, guest editorship for sustainability series of articles at our Canadian Journal. And that made us think, what do we need? Where, what do we need knowledge development in? So we reached out strategically to specific people to get this skill set, to develop this skill set. And now we can use these materials. So we're developing a group of uh, patient care resources. Um, we've With Cascades, we've done this amazing um, kidney care playbook and infographic. And now we've got a curriculum we can take to our population at large. Next next slide. Yeah, so again, those principles in red. And uh, yeah, next one. Thank you. And because in Canada, even though we're geographically big, our population is small and the population that we serve on the global scale is relatively small. So again, realizing that no system is designing products for us. And so so I was very, I think it was just good timing, good luck. And one of my collaborators happened to be um, on this emerging steering committee. So I found myself on the steering committee of this environmental initiative um, through the International Society of Nephrology. So uh, the, I think another key message here was that this group was discussing, having lots of discussions, and I felt we really needed to move forward, and we needed to put something in writing for the community. So I volunteered to do that. Um, and I think that was a really big personal step for me. It was kind of out of my comfort zone. But it's this very significant, I would say, foundational editorial um, that we put out that I'm incredibly proud of. And next slide. Yep, hard work. It was it was a lot of conversations. Yeah. And next slide. And this is a, a graphic. So we thought up this graphic, which is just so, I, I think, really, really helpful. And I use it in all the talks and we're seeing this kind of emerging as foundational thinking. So it's it's a different way to view this planetary health um, aspect, you know, health promotion, risk factor identification, modification via lifestyle, et cetera. And, and next slide. So where do we start? And I put through this is I put this in every one of my talk. Go for things that are high impact. Go for things that you can do quickly, where you can get some success going, some energy and some enthusiasm. Figure out how to pull a lot of people in so that we quote make every job a climate job. I think that's such a useful ambition. Leverage your advantages. Tap into resources that are already there and people who already know how to get things done and get people on board, get them excited. And next slide. Uh, maybe just go down till we get the graphics on this one. Yeah, perfect. So uh, uh, allowing, please, my corny analogy of a sandwich. <laughs> so we've got, uh, I've heard Fiona talk about bottom-up enthusiasm. So there's this groundswell of interest. People want to do the right thing, right? And then we hopefully uh, have some, some say uh, or inroads to people who have a say for systems. What, what can we do top down? What can we do within our systems that will enable better processes so that we can have this so-called magic in the middle? And this is a useful analogy for me because this is really making every job the climate job. So there's literature on how to do this. And those are those four steps. Show people what the regulations are. Show them what we're supposed to be doing. And then get the management on board. Get some key performance indicators and report on this iteratively and improve your processes. Get the data and then get everybody involved. And next slide. 
So you can just go right down. We'll get all of these tips for your journey. I was actually thinking about calling this talk healthy dose of outrage because sometimes some days I think I have an unhealthy dose of outrage, but you need that. Like go back to that slide of how did, you know, NASA tells us the CO2 level being so high is so completely unacceptable. Um, and so we have to have to work with that outrage, that fire in our belly to, 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 to inspire and to um, make us really work for change. And, and I'm really aware, I don't want this to be a greenwashing initiative. I think, how can we reduce carbon? How can we reduce our environmental effect? So I think another key point that I wanted to make uh, a, a point about here is to be compassionate. Um, this point here that we're at different stages of acceptance and action, I think I haven't encountered any frank resistance to this, but there are skeptics, there are some maybe doubters, there are people who say it can't be done, there are people who don't feel that this is really a professional initiative that we need to do, um, and, and just to... Um, I think win them over um, with enthusiasm and information. And then just to really be strategic about the thinking. And next slide. This is about a big graphic that I have on my desk. I, I think it came for, from the Center for Sustainable Healthcare in, um, uh, in the UK. And uh, it just kind of grounds me. It, it's fun, it's bright. And I thought maybe it might help inspire other people. So I'll, I'll hand it over uh, to uh, to my colleague, Dr. Smith, and happy to have a discussion about some of that at the end. And yeah, I'd like to take this time to just share how uh, we've operationalized healthcare sustainability in the perioperative space in Ontario and beyond. And uh, this this quote uh, really resonated with me, and has as I've been uh, as we've been on this journey and. It was from you, Fiona, who once told me that formal leadership training is to empower people who are already doing great work. And I think what it speaks to me is just about like, there's a lot of great people and teams and collaborations. And if you can identify them and if you can align them and then ask how you can support them, great things will happen. Uh, I had at the very beginning to acknowledge the fact that where I work and we all work in a space uh, in the OR, we make a lot of waste while delivering quality care. A third of hospital waste is made in this space, and we can't continue to discount that waste, even if we are making people better. So that was our my call to action, but also my opportunity to start to join, I guess, and lead in this space, because there was definitely work to be done, but it wasn't my space. It was a, a group of frontline people that work every day, and I we did a walkabout and just pretended to be a patient, walked through the front door, registered, and pretend to have a uh, a colonoscopy. So we met all the people until we were discharged out and asked them, what waste do you see? And uh, sure enough, there were two or three very, very repeated items that they said, this is what we see. And I think it's important to ask those questions because then it becomes, you've empowered those people that are going to do the change to inform the change we're going to do. And suddenly you have a team so the first step is an important way to show credibility. We uh, shamelessly stole ideas that had been successful else, elsewhere and brought it to our, our hospital. And here's Tessie sort of saying, you know, just like our front line, we see so many plastic bags used for patients' shoes and clothes just to hold their garments while they have the procedure that then go in the garbage in the landfill. So a little data goes a long way. It turns out, in fact, 36,000 of these bags were being used in our perioperative program, 120,000 of these bags every year in our hospital. And um, so I, in one office, my office, we simply send out an email saying, as our change idea, please bring your own reusable bags, one big enough for your shoes, one big enough for your clothes. And we had 90% engagement by patients, 90% positive feedback. And now we had what we like to affectionately call in QI a good one. And the question then is always about if you have a good one, you're sort of you're responsible to spread it, scale it. And we, I think the question everyone has to ask in their space is who's your QI team? Like in my space, it is the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. My hospital invests in it. Went to that team and said, would you guys like to join and lead the spread of this good one? And uh, in order to align well with them, we know that NISQIP is all about quality data, driving quality action. So we gave them data and we, we met um, as patients were registered, asked if they brought their own bag, starting at zero and now over 80%. But it became a NISQIP story. And that um, really set us up well to sort of go to our provincial 
collaboration of NISQIPS, or as Fiona mentioned, the ONSQUIN Ontario Surgical Quality Improvement Team of almost 50 hospitals, to say, what if we partnered or at a provincial level, took this kind of a, um, a 50 teams leaning in on the same idea and supported by Cascades, who would give us a how to do it sort of playbook, education, whatever we needed. And again, I think when you go with enthusiasm and that information, the um, the central teams that are now getting to the provincial or system level start to say, let's try. And we came up with the Cut the Carbon campaign. We took the change ideas that had been important to our people, achievable areas to reduce waste, whether it be bags, styrofoam cups, reusable gowns, desflurane, custom packs. And we, we said to the 50 teams in the province, go ahead, uh, let us know how we can support you. We have Cascades um, supporting each and every one of these changes. And in 2023, the first year of that campaign, we had 86% or, or 40 plus teams that took on a, a, a reduced waste effort. And the actual numbers of their individual success is less important that now we have a system change or a culture change in its perioperative mindset that sustainability is part of the quality agenda. And uh, the next step is always sort of like, well, how do we we go from here? And and we uh, strategically, I would say, identified five additional achievable change ideas also supported by the Cascades playbook, whether it be in leadership, low value care, other gases, reusables and waste. And that was intentional to align with the Toronto Academic Health Science Network perioperative sustainable scorecard. So and that's what we're working on in 2024. Now we're not just aligned with Cascades and OnSquin, but with the TASM scorecard. We believe it's a tool that will be allow any hospital to do audits of how they're doing in the perioperative space, compare it to others. And, um, and so that's where we're at. I think that our next steps are going to be to keep the conversation going to, again, recognize great work or great ideas coming from people turn them into little trials of change in our own little space. And when it, if those little trials turn out to be good ones to, uh, to scale and spread using whatever collaborations we have and always asking the magic question, how can we support you? So that's where we're at and I'll stop sharing. Go back to you, Kate or Fiona. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. That's wonderful. Thank you, Carolyn. That's fabulous. So so it's always nice to hear those kind of quick snippets of a tremendous amount of work that's hidden behind that sort of seven minutes from each of you. And now to sort of think about some of those generalizable lessons uh, that you can share with the community. And um, so, you know, you talked, Dave, directly, and, and I think Carolyn as well, about there's this frontline change, and then there's these higher level str strategies that could be at the provincial level, like BC Renal or, or Ontario Health Quality um, or, or the national level. How do you bridge that gap? What are the strategies that are most effective in going from that immediate to a, a system player and, 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 uh, and trying to move that forward? I mean, my, my simple answer to that is that whether you're sitting at the provincial table or whether you're at the front line of the uh, OR number six in whatever hospital you're at, it's all basically people looking for good ones. So if you do, um, if you, if you've identified one, you know, it just is a good one. People will listen. Even if you go to the provincial level, you think that they're doing things that are more important, but they all need the same thing. Something that's going to have an impact. It's going to be a win and going to drive change. So I find the conversations are more similar than they are different. And if there's uh, frontline people willing to sort of be the champions, then that is gold to uh, system level leaders that are, that need that, frankly. Mm -hmm. Carol, yeah, you... Sure. Yeah. In, in my experience, I, I echo everything David has said. Um, it, it did not come about overnight and you use the word conversations. And when I was first trying to define what sustainable nephrology was my the first word that came up was conversations and i it'll be a spectrum right like there'll always be conversations of course but they'll they'll be moving in a specific direction but as we're moving towards technological solutions which i think we tend to probably overly uh rely on you know I, I, but these conversations just built and built and it became more about system level I agree. I think you really need a champion. You really need someone who knows um, the subject matter. Um, but to, 
as I said in my talk, really figure out who holds the levers of power. You know, there's committees and there's chair people and um, the, the, getting the CSN committee was a really big one. And then I think gaining the trust of the administrative community that I work in um, through all of the research work. And I think they realized she's not going away. <laughs> and uh, and at the same time, you know, it aligned with their strategic goals. Um, so we're hearing this societally. And I think that's a really important one is that there are a lot of administrators and management, they, they really want this right now, um, but they're not trained in it either. So we're kind of finding our way as we go. And um, it is a process. Yeah. Right. Well, did you face obstacles or resistance and how did you manage that um if if it was there dave did you want to start there yeah and i think you and i've talked about how resistance is wisdom and and actually the important way forward and so so yes i mean when we went to the provincial uh central teams of the quality agenda and said the sustainability or we should see the quality agenda through a green lens they weren't sure about that. It didn't quite fit with our traditional UTI and SSI and all those metrics that we have uh, used. But when we sort of um, got them to imagine that uh, healthy planet, healthy people, like there is a connection there. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, that a healthy quality agenda has a has a engagement and has a uh, capacity for change where there's enthusiasm and show them that, as Caroline said, there's enormous interest and talent and energy at the front line. So I think that was our biggest win was that effectively through these campaigns, we've changed how the quality agenda is viewed at all levels to be inclusive of or seen through a sustainable green lens. I've jotted the, down. Sorry, sorry. I was just going to say that the resistance at first was them sort of saying a like this must be somebody else's responsibility because it's not an SSI. In fact, now they see that whatever they do, even reducing complications reduces a carbon footprint so we can align. I jotted down some notes here and I have four examples of obstacles along the way and how um, how they've really changed. So uh, I think the first obstacle, uh, the first obvious obstacle was when, you know, I took this adapted this business plan, if you will, from what the UK investigators had said a decade and a half ago, how you should set up your own sustainability program, how I took that to BC Renal. And initially, it, you know, it was a no, but again, it, I don't, they've been an unbelievably supportive and I don't want to create the illusion that they haven't been, but I appreciate it, it was a very novel thing. And so it was a, please work on it. Just stay with this. The second problem was me that I didn't have the skill set, and I didn't know if I, I didn't know what it was going to involve. And if I, if someone had said to me four years from now, that slide that I showed with all the different things, um, I, I wouldn't have believed that I would have taken all of that on. Um, and so the part about getting out of your comfort zone incrementally, like the incremental steps have been really important and really big. Um, the third thing I would say is in uh, some of our discussion with industry partners, the comments that we got back were, well, this has nothing to do with us. And so it's that, again, like help them realize that they're not uh, providing appropriate service for today and and tomorrow and, and our entire future. Yes, it absolutely is. And be kind and be courteous and um, people will will see the way. Um, and then the last the last example was um, the first time we submitted our uh, our proposed framework for planetary health and nephrology. I think they didn't know what to make of it. Um, and so they, you know, the editors uh, came back with all of these comments and we pushed back and we said, no, this is why we're writing this. And this is here's the reference and this is what you need to know. And this is why we feel this needs to stay in this article. And the response back was can you please um, be a guest editor for a sustainability series to which we said, holy smokes, you know, behind our back, we thought, can we, I don't know, can we? Yes, we can help us out. And, and absolutely we can. So people have been, I would say, brought into the process all along. Yeah. We have a question from Jennifer Carson that's somewhat, I think, answered by what you've said, but I want to make sure that uh, they were in a organizational strategy meeting, the person sharing the meeting, but the suggestion in a parking lot said, you know, ESG or environmental social governance issues aren't clinical. So it sounds like you've addressed that. You've kind of reframed it. 
Um, you know, and, and also it sounds like you've also not taken the first no. Like you can kind of expect that the first time it's raised, this is pretty foreign stuff. So you're not going in there raging. You're going in there with something that needs to be considered. There's persistence and you're coming back. And is, is that is that sort of, is that right? Absolutely. And I think that's where that sort of physician education part, uh, my, my feedback to this um, good question would be, show them data on air pollution. Like if you want to show them one thing, 99% of people in the world now breathe air quality that's above, that's worse than what the World Health Organization has recommended. And you look at any, you look at, it's the number one cause of strokes, it's the number one cause for heart disease. We call it something else. And so there's also over a hundred thousand attributable cases of chronic kidney disease due to poor air um, quality in our country, in our country alone. Um, so, I mean, the, it's it's really staggering when you um, show the health effects. Um, I would also um, look at uh, Health Quality BC's care matrix, and I believe you figure that quite prominently um, in the Cascades uh, literature, and, and that shows the environmental sustainability as this peg in the middle around all these other dimensions of care. And so this foundational sense of that if we don't have health our, our environmental determinants of health are not in place, our societal determinants of health are not in place, and our personal health is not in place. So just it, this is this is absolutely a health issue. And if people say that it's an optional extra, they're absolutely wrong because it's a health issue. I mean, I would I would say that somebody in a uh, uh, said that it's, um, um, sustainability is not clinical. I, I guess I would acknowledge they probably have a lot of things they have to do and we're not asking them to not do what their agendas are it's about doing it with with in a new and a sustainable way um to really drive that and and get their creative understandings going if i had a person say that i would make sign uh, urge them to sign up for one of cascades foundation uh, courses and two two hour sessions or one four hour session they would immediately feel credible and understand some of caroline's points about the urgency here. So we're not asking anyone to do different work or more and more thing. We're just asking them to do it in a sustainable way. I mean, Bavini's asked, Bavini Goal from, from Alberta, is leading a lot of work there, um, is asking about the challenge of funding and capacity. Um, creeping strain within departments, I certainly am seeing that st strategy and building strategic resiliency, she says, needs to be embedded in areas, processes already in place. So. Um, I don't know if you're seeing her question here. The, the, the challenge for executive leadership is that there's a lack of experts, unclear pathways on how they can create a role with executive leadership. Funding is an issue. Um, so is is that are those some of the issues that that you faced, or do you feel like you're in a different context that's more supportive, perhaps? Or is it that there are different ways around some of these obstacles that can be that can be tried? I'm happy to take the first stab at that one. Um, I think you. Unfortunately, this is where um, someone as a leader and advocate has to really throw your hat into the ring and come forward um, with with meaningful information um, that uh, this is meant to be a cost saving initiative um, and it's work. It's looking at efficiencies within the system. So um, we are what we've shown uh, we have data on this in kidney care is that everything that is aligned with patient care is also cost effective is also climate resilient and is also uh, a lower environmental footprint so uh this is this is really important the other thing is um uh yeah i so maybe show them some case examples. There's a lot that's um, that show cost savings um, on the UK sustainable network, and we use those um, in kidney care. So I would say maybe find some resources and I think convince them that, um, as David said, this is the way we operate now. Yeah, and I, I would say like start where you are. And uh, if you feel an overwhelming, this isn't happening, take a step back, reflect on like start with a win, like start with a simple step. I mean, we would not ever recommend uh, someone go to a group that has not got the sustainability conversation uh, matured yet and start trying to tackle the most complicated thing. Start with a simple one, get send them to a Cascades course. And I mean, now we're at a, a point in the surgical collaborative where um, 
you know, the scorecard is something that CEOs can all agree on, especially when it's validated by an academic network like Tazin. So now we can sort of talk to them in languages and report cards that they can relate to and say, you know, listen, we walked around our OR, we're in the red in all 10 of these, or we're in the green. If we're all in the red, we got some, uh, we got to continue this conversation. And if we're all in the green, we've got some celebrations and leadership roles that we need to advance to spread beyond the four walls of our organization. Can I ask about um, the argument I sometimes, I mean, you've talked about it, that there's tremendous enthusiasm within the front line. And I'm interested in this question as to whether or when um, sustainability is an added burden or is an enabler of action, um, because it comes down to a question, you know, we have often about prioritizing. How would you prioritize this above something else? And, and one part of that priority setting puzzle, I think, is the health human resource challenge, which we all know is really quite overwhelming across Canada and indeed around the world. So how are, in your experience, how are these issues interfacing with the health human resource challenge? Maybe it's too glib to say that it's sometimes empowering, but maybe sometimes it is, but sometimes it presumably is more. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I mean, I think you do have to have your finger on the pulse at the front line. If it's getting discombobulating, you have to be wise enough and comfortable enough to take a step back and patient enough. Like I know that we've spent a year or two talking about reusable gowns and thinking uh, despite numerous start stops, learnings and successes that it's not really going. And now suddenly there's a collaboration of hospitals looking at this at a more executive level. And, and maybe the learning is certain items do need to be managed at the executive level of your hospital who themselves are part of a bunch of CEOs that are gonna get it done. So that's okay. Um, if you feel there's discombobulation, maybe um, just turn the heat down a little bit. It's a marathon, not a sprint, as much as we'd like to fix this problem immediately. Um, you know, if you sort of just have to follow the energy and be aware of where the the positive momentum is. Well, that's great. I had I had a thought on that too. My, my sense is that the bulk of the burden lies in the fact that we're not moving fast enough, that we're not doing enough. And so for me, the issue is like, again, that corny sandwich analogy, but we're, we're hopefully most of us here are in a position of top down. Like, so what can you implement that will make people effective in this role? And that is where I think management has to be really um, careful these days, because I agree, you don't want more, you know, waste sorting burden, let's say, by the staff. But I'll tell you, the staff want to do it. They don't want to see stuff going away. So so what we've done um, and what we're trying to roll out within renal is um, sorting biohazard. And then we tell them why it's really important to sort biohazard. Biohazard waste gets autoclaved and then incinerated. It has a massively higher carbon footprint than general waste does. So if people end understand that they know there's a bin there the job is making the bin accessible and so really this is this is how our systems have to work is how can we empower our staff so that they do green on the job quote green every day without necessarily making that any more effort to their work stream and they'll feel better about it so can i follow that up by asking um about you know the, the the need for quick wins and the whole low hanging fruit question. So there are gonna be some things that are easier to move. They tend to, and maybe you'll challenge me on this, but they tend to be part of the feasibility is they're less complex. Part of the part of the, what makes them a quick win is you can, you, it's not easy, but they're achievable. And some of the bigger issues we might wish to take on are bigger risk, bigger challenge, bigger resistance, bigger. And I guess I'm wondering about um, whether we need to stay in the place of, of improvement and, and sort of still in that, let's not, we can't rock the boat too much. I mean, some of the changes we, we would think about would be, you know, transforming what we buy and how we buy it, uh, shifting to a more, you know, community-based primary care led system, improving access to housing. You know, I mean, you keep going, you keep going farther and farther away and they get farther away from our control. But 
they're also sort of uncertain and, and, and we're not quite sure how well they're going to work. So wh where do you think our focus should be? Do you feel that you're trying to balance a portfolio with some of the things that are easier and some of the things that are more difficult and challenging? Or how do you, I don't know if that's a coherent question. I mean, I'm, I'm a simple fella. Like I stay where it feels fantastic. So <laughs> if, there's a, uh, if I'm feeling down about it, that's not good for the sustainability agenda. I back off. Uh, for example, like the, yeah, we've had some, uh, whoa, Dave, I just, it, it, this feels like one more thing right now. And then you look the other way and there's a new group of passionate people wanting to drive the agenda, whether it's resident, resident led sustainability, there's only so much of a quality team. Why wouldn't you choose to, to spend your next period of time with that enthusiasm? It's okay to pivot. And then you might go back and wow, who knew like that same sort of uh, executive suite that you thought wasn't so engaged is suddenly building a sustainability tower, having conversations about how to do planetary menus for the patients. Mm -hmm. You you can sort of, you got to follow the fun and the, and the uplifting energy. There's enough of those lanes out there until you run out of momentum lanes, you shouldn't be in the, the discouraging lanes. Oh, I love that. What do you think? I, I love that too. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm learning a lot listening to you, um, David. It's, it's really, really neat conversation. Um, and I think I'll say the same thing, but maybe in a different way. And and I, I seized on that word you used about pivot, because what surprised me in this is the things that should be simple sometimes aren't simple. And the things that seem Ooh. like you could never achieve that when there's a will to get it done, it's talking to the right people and convincing them why things need to happen. And so I think, I think, you know, they say that the climate change activists in general, even outside of healthcare, say, talk about it, talk about climate change, talk about this stuff, every opportunity you have. And I think there's seeds that are planted, you know, so sometimes it takes a while to germinate, you know, it's germinating behind your back, you're not sure what's going on. Um, and then big opportunities arise. So I would say just be prepared to pivot and know when, uh, you know, when to dig your feet in about certain things that are really important and, and, and when to move. Yeah. You know, one other little strategy I have is recently we had a big uh, one of our green teams and we were really pushing hard for reusables. And there was almost a discouragement when the central, the, the higher ups were sort of saying, you know, we're going to take this on at a, a higher level. And then like they felt as though some of they were taking, you know, some of their passion project. And I was like, you know what, your work is done here. If you've got them saying they want to do it, let them win, let them lead. You've got other projects and there's a pivot point. But I mean, I think just defining success carefully, like it doesn't, we personally, Caroline does not personally have to push every nephrology sustainability project over the end zone. If she's got people talking about it and other people come up with great ideas at whatever level, let them win, let them lead. And as Fiona, you always say, the better question is uh, not how can we change you, but how can we support you? And then suddenly let them do the heavy lifting and we're just there to cheer them on. Hmm. Yeah. And care, building on that is, you know, the importance of these networks. So, we, you know, with SNAP, we've got uh, a toehold in the pediatric world. We've got a toehold in uh, every um, province and major renal program. So someone, the, the whole idea is if someone comes up with a great idea, even if it's small, we can just amplify it right across the country. And then we've got a toehold internationally with groups. So if someone in, you know, Argentina thinks up something good, that's the idea. And these little things add up. So I'll give you one small example. Um, and that was uh, intravenous iron, which is given really commonly in our dialysis programs. So traditionally, it's given over a series of 10 doses. So the, they would um, inject the medic, you know, you draw it up from the vial and you inject it into the mini bag and you hang it and you put it into the machine. Well, someone had a great idea that we could just draw it up and then IV push it. Um, like slowly, but, you know, there was some safety concerns and everything was done um, correctly, but this has now been um, like, we're, we're in the process of rolling it out provincially. And the one area that started it in Fraser Health has saved over 4,900 mini bags um, for injection. So this, this adds up in a major, major way um, in surgical systems, in emergency medicine, intensive care, endoscopy units, renal, any hospital unit. So that there's these seemingly small ideas. And that's what it was. It was one idea, one person with one idea. 
So again, just build on that enthusiasm. And, and you know, we've got a, a way to, to recognize this and a shout out to that person. And we're going to take that data and you know, amplify it by province. And if we amplified it by country, and then we'll show them, look at what you've done, look at the success that you've brought about. So share those wins. Yeah. That's yeah, great. I think that sounds like a good one, Caroline. And that would be one we would love to shamelessly steal and use it our do. <laughs> iron infusion. And then, you know, and that kind of, that kind of good story is a good one is really powerful. So are there some um, particular skills that folks like you feel you need to have when you're when you're in this place of really exercising leadership are there are there some particular things you try to do or try not to do i hate to ask you about leadership competencies or put it in some sort of framework but just sort of when you when you if you were advising colleagues on how they need to act perhaps or what they need to invigorate in, them, in themselves in terms of their own capacities are there some particular do's and don'ts that you would kind of encourage I mean, I just think that if you really see yourself as a leader, like uh, then your your real primary job is to build out the capacity of all those people with passions for the topic to join and lead. And and just um, so there's no greater accomplishment, like as great as it is reducing plastic bags or uh, changing custom packs or whatever, is more important watching somebody else take their passions, turn it into a change and supporting them. And then they're talking all over the province about how we do it kind of thing. So I don't know. I, I think it's about if we're going to have a culture change and a new philosophy for how we deliver healthcare, we need everybody not just seeing their job as a sustainability job, but themselves as leaders. So just visualizing how that capacity is increased. And there is an enormous increase in the capacity of people doing green uh, things. So so it's, uh, and the younger generation that's coming along, they are signing up for masters and fellowships that are combined clinically with this kind of work. So, I mean, it, you just have to think back, where were we a year or two ago and where we are now, the trajectory is a very favorable one. Hmm. Your thoughts on that, Carolyn? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, I had a few of those pointers on that slide, the, you know, the flip side of the outrage that I mentioned is, is caring, right? And so I think it's, it's really just um, hearing people and understanding that, uh, you know, they, they do care, people care deeply about this issue, as they should, we all should. Um, and so it's just enabling that it's, um, they are, they are manifesting their human values in their work sphere and they have every right to do that. And we should make sure that people have every opportunity to do that because it is, it's living out your values in your workplace. It just feels right. Can I ask then an orthogonal question and be a bit cheeky picking up on that and, and, and ask and being a bit challenging. So I sometimes um, I'm wondering whether or not we really need people to be on board with with our goal for this that sometimes you're working with somebody who has quite a different goal um and and that's fine uh, and i know i've talked to colleagues in different parts of the country who have said i don't need to call it climate i don't want to call it climate uh i'm going to call it heat or i'm going to call it housing or i'm going to call it equity you know access or whatever it is i'm going to call it and i and i found this particularly in some work that we're doing locally with our efforts here in Ontario to create more integrated health and health and social care, where some of the work that's happening with communities in particular, climate is not front of mind. Um, and yet the work, there's a potential to do the work without making this our common goal. And, and I wonder if you've experienced that or if, or if you would maybe disagree with that. Um, I mean, I think we there... have, sorry, you go ahead, Caroline. Oh, thank you. Um, there have been murmurings of that without there being, I would say, an overt tone of that. Um, and uh, the, I, I contextualize that as people feel threatened by this issue. And my typical response is that um, there is a lot of emotion around climate change and that the way that society prioritizes things, there is legitimate debate for, but there is absolutely no debate about its effect on our health. And as a healthcare provider, this is my role and it's all of our role. So I think just bring it back to we're in healthcare for a reason and this is our absolute need right now. This is a, a major crisis facing humanity. 
I would also take it back to thinking about that planetary health framework in your particular area of care. And so nobody could could ever dispute the fact that risk factor identification and treating risk factors is better than establishing disease. And in turn, that treating um, disease so it doesn't progress is better than accepting end stage of a disease process. So perhaps we have a clearer pathway in kidney care than in others. But again, that it, it helps us tremendously that we're saying exactly what everybody is saying, that we're not asking for environmental care and not patient care. Patient care is environmental care right now, and we're just showing them that. So we're showing them the greater context of all of this. Um, and so it's it's really enhancing patient care and, and I think keep it um, health and uncontroversial first and foremost, because to me, there's no room for controversy and we all work together on this one. Dave? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's important that we keep quality relationships with all people doing all the different quality work, even if they may not call it sustainability. Um, there's efficiencies and improved patient results. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to expand my way of how I look at a reduced carbon uh, uh, footprint can be reduced in so many ways. Um, and I think our job is just to, if, if, for example, delirium is a big provincial conversation. If we can get that right, and if we can be at the table having the conversation and find out where um, improvements in delirium can also improve reduce uh, extra resources that would otherwise be needed if a, too many patients do get delirium, we can still celebrate improving patient care and reducing delirium and at the same time reducing the carbon footprint. But during that journey, the shared journey together, we, you know, all sorts of great new ideas are going to come up. And as long as we're um, partnered in it and helping each other to see how this is really all about getting to uh, at that new philosophy, uh, I think it will actually inspire and add energy to many of the important patient care things that really lacked energy. And I think that's the big power of this climate crisis is that there is energy that is moving many agendas forward. I think we just keep uh, keep trying to make that clear that uh, the sustainability really overlaps and, and improves a lot of agendas. Right. Well, Bavini's just Bavini Gowell's just put in this comment about uh, the citizen advisory groups, patient groups in acute care who've helped um, help move the agenda in seeing, understanding, and mobilizing this understanding of this as being about patient care. And all this, this, these opportunities for alignment um, with the agendas for, for change that exist. Hooray for the patients. I, I mean, it is like, you know, it's sort of sad that it came to that, right? And I reflect in medical education, it's sad that the students asked for planetary health education before we could deliver it. So we're really behind. Um, and uh, Bavini, just keep chipping away at it. And the patients are are great. They can be a, a, a really good voice for you. Um, yeah, work on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting one. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, we're, we're coming to the end, but I, I do want to ask whether the the climate shocks and stresses that are increasingly increasingly visible to all of us. I mean, here in Toronto, there are people who are willing to talk to me who two years ago were staring at me blankly, not, not, not from any kind of resistance, just from sort of not seeing it, but Toronto experienced, and I apologize to other people in other parts of the country for whom this is normal, but last summer we lived through wildfire smoke. So shocking. <laughs> uh, and then, and then, and then that, that really woke people up and, but it's also calling, it's also causing people to think about the adaptation sides of these things because these shocks and stresses are growing. And Carolyn, you're in what my BC colleagues, you know, you got you're on the pointy end of that of that stick. You really are uh, at the leading edge of, of exposure to climate shocks and stresses. And whether that's also part of how you're grappling with these issues or whether that's enabling or, or disabling, uh, I'm just interested in your reflections on that as this becomes more visible to more and more and more of us. Yeah, it, it's huge. It's huge within kidney care, of course, because um, many kidney therapies, of course, are lifelines for our patients. And so uh, BC Renal uh, has a extremely robust emergency uh, response network. They've got surge nursing capacity. They've got um, contingency plans for how to um, increase services at uh, different centers if patients have to be airlifted. We, dealed, uh, we dealt in a major way with the evacuations um, from uh, 
the Northwest Territories uh, last summer. So we have, sadly, we have experience in this, but we have, I would say, as rock solid a, a disaster management plan as we can. And through SNAP, we've recognized we, one of our members, Dr. Uh, Shafali Sandal, is doing fantastic work compiling all of the emergency plans in renal programs across the country. And we're looking at having some unification of emergency response, given the very unique um, uh, vulnerability of our patients. And we will say in our initial environmental survey that uh, pediatric literature was, ver there were only two publications on emergency response in pediatrics. So that's a major call to action for our community um, and really, really important thing to have solidly in place. Great. Well, I, looking at the time, I'm gonna ask each of you to offer just your final thoughts and uh, guidance to your colleagues who are listening here about how the, how folks can move the agenda both at the front line, but also um, utilize those tables that they're at, those networks that they're at to push at program level. Final, final thoughts and recommendations. Dave, do you want to start? I just look at what you do every day. Um, think of, uh, I'm, I, you know, think of those societies that for many years have talked about how there's a uh, a better way, but maybe it's choosing wisely and identify a project that aligns exactly with what you do and, and with the principles that they're recommending and, and do a small trial. And if it's a good one, share it, run it up the ladder, if you like, through your division, your organization, your collaborative teams, and do not underestimate your ability to join and lead this sustainability change. With a simple Cascades Foundations course, you'll have you'll feel more than credible if you're passionate about it. Um, let us know how we can support you and you got this. Thanks. Yeah, certainly echo that. And, uh, you know, when we were planning for this session, you know, we kind of had a laugh about it. Should we talk about love? Um, so I, I have to throw the word love in. It's just, um, I think it's really important, you know, to, to love our planet, love yourselves, love what you're doing in this, in this voyage and just stay grounded in it, do it for the right reasons. And just to echo that sentiment to chip away at it daily. I, I just do something every day. Um, and you can't do it all in one day, but just build on it. And the third thing that I would say is really be strategic in your thinking. You have to draw other people in here. So think about how like how you can empower a lot of people um, to do good work and who can help you doing that. Great. I've just thrown in uh, Adam Kahane's piece from last year, uh, Radical Collaboration, uh, Love, Power and Justice. And I it's an absolutely brilliant uh, paper that I would recommend. He's been doing, you know, collaborative social change, transformational change, and is doing climate work. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful, it picks up on what you're saying about the importance of love. So I just want to thank so much our, our guest speakers for this amazing uh, panel. I really appreciate you sharing your time, your expertise, your your love, your power, and your justice with all of us as we as we uh, move forward together in this area. It's just been brilliant. Um, we just want to say that uh, we have another one of these uh, coming up uh, with Sean Atleo and Heather Atleo, Compassionate Leadership Approach to Advanced Sustainability. Uh, speaking to the issues today, we do have an Applied Fundamentals course uh, on Sustainable Perioperative Care and Environmentally Sustainable Kidney Care Workshop. And both of those can be found on our website. So if you're interested in those, those specific issues, that the critical issues that Dave and Carolyn have helped us understand in their clinical areas, then these are available. And we just really appreciate you uh, sharing your time with us uh, because that's how we learn and that's how we move this, uh, we move the needle. Thank you very much, folks. Take care. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks, guys.